extremely difficult topic to explain uh, end to end in 20 minutes. I was thinking um, how to split it into pieces so uh, it makes sense and uh, you get the point. And then, uh, as Sona said, it's a journey. So uh, talking about the journey is not enough in 20 minutes, definitely. So uh, we're going to have three events. Uh, I don't know the dates yet, but uh, today it will be a little bit more high level. So it's not going to be too technical. I have to disappoint you who came to see Turkey demos. We'll show them next uh, time. Uh, but today we'll set the context so you understand uh, what and uh, you will understand a little bit uh, how, but you will, not, you will not understand where. Uh, so next event and third event will explain the other pieces. So today we're going to start with uh, overall migration architecture and um, uh, what is estate, what is our scope basically. And then a little bit about uh, discovery and migration wave planning. So migration approach. Um, one of most important slides, and probably I could stay only with one slide and uh, speak about it days and days. But um, uh, we're going to execute migration by simple lift and shift approach. And uh, immediately after starting it, there will be next phase kicked off, which is going to be uh, infra and, and core optimization. Um, so you could probably ask your questions yourself immediately. Okay, running thousands of VMs on public cloud doesn't make sense. It's, it's just too expensive. You cannot uh, compete with a good, uh, good managed private cloud and have same cost. Uh, and uh, this is why immediately after VMs are moved to AWS, we're going to start uh, things like FinOps, optimizing workloads, powering off, powering on, uh, spot reserved instances, and stuff like that. And uh, then when time comes, uh, it's also not in sequence. It, it can start uh, basically almost immediately. Uh, there will be application uh, modernization. Um, so you might ask, why not do modernization in the first place? Why we have to lift and shift a huge estate and then hope that modernization will happen eventually? Um, there are many reasons, but basically to get to the public cloud, you can, you can have two options. Uh, one option, you spend time and modernize. So you take application which is running on-premise decouple it, decompose, understand the runtime, database storage, all of it, and then you change it to use cloud native services. Um, and we have around 1,000 applications. So you can imagine uh, how long time it might take to do it. Uh, I mean, not, all, not like one by one, but still if you couple applications, still years and years of modernization. And uh, option number two is just kind of throw everything over the fence. And then uh, on, uh, on that um, emotion, on that momentum, start modernizing immediately. And uh, momentum will be coming from different places. It's cost pressure. It's uh, opportunity to modernize because we in the cloud already, we have stretch key, technical capabilities. Everything is kind of there. You just need to spend time to modernize. So. Uh, super important slide because it di dictates all the next steps that we're doing. And uh, those next steps are actually uh, very much uh, engineering and architecting based on approach. So I'll try to walk you through the journey. And uh, we'll start from big picture, as I said, and uh, discuss a little bit about scope. So what's, what's the estate we're moving there? And uh, I'll stop today at uh, discovery and wave planning phase and uh, hope to see you next time where we'll dig deep into migration execution. Actually, I'm coming straight from workshop where we have been building migration execution end to end with a set of automation tools. So uh, demos are promised for next time. So let's, let's start then uh, from very, very top level view. Uh, it's it's going to be simplified, but you have to understand the context. So 
Penske Bank is running on private cloud. There are two physical data centers. It's extremely well built, um, very good uh, automation level. Some people who raise their hand that uh, the internal employees, they probably know cloud too. This is well known uh, term, but actually it's a set of tools, services, microservices, automating it all in a very, very good level. In the um, last uh, something like five years, uh, Cloud2 automation uh, changed like 40 ServiceNow's, ServiceNow uh, forms uh, and automated roughly 80 services and subservices. So you, you don't need to go to ServiceNow, create a ticket asking, resize my VM or, or deploy 10 VMs to me or uh, add load balancing or stuff like that. So it's all automated. Um, in one year, it's processing like one, one million successful events. Uh, so it's, it's a scaled, automated, and very well working system. And again, you might ask, so if you have such good public, sorry, pre private cloud, why do you think about public? Um, but those, those answers will be answered a little bit later. So um, we are not new in, in AWS, and now, as you can see, it's uh, AWS, our choice. Uh, something like four years now, uh, we started uh, uh, with small footprint, uh, started to build from zero, basically. And uh, this, this build now is uh, extremely uh, complete, I should say, but there was one condition. We were building it uh, for cloud-native purpose. So uh, we're running uh, two organizations, something like 230 uh, AWS accounts, uh, and uh, uh, everything in well-automated manner, infra as a code, uh, you expose to developers and you just take it and use it. But uh, the problem was that um, it wasn't enough for lift and shift migration. And uh, we received three key requirements, uh, which uh, di dictated so-called new custom landing zone build. And this is what we're doing today. It's almost finished. I would say like 80% done. And I'll briefly explain what are those requirements. Uh, so requirement number one is uh, not to change application uh, architecture at all. So you can imagine if you dec de decompose application, it can have front end, back end, storage database, some integrations, middleware, you name it. And uh, the way we want to migrate is just to keep it as is. So we don't have any chance to do any modifications. Um, requirement number two is to keep self-service the same. So it means that uh, this new landing zone in AWS uh, cannot be accessed by developers' application teams. So how crazy is that? I mean, we are, it's now 10 accounts in AWS for this landing zone. And we will not let UI or API or CLI um, interaction to developers uh, into those accounts. So you could think of it as extension of uh, private cloud. It's just diff different physical location. Uh, but logical concept is exactly the same. So it's going to be pretty isolated environment, uh, controlled by uh, internal engineering teams, and uh, very highly automated, so you don't feel, uh, is your workload running on private cloud or on public? Because your entry point is cloud too. So uh, at the moment, we have uh, stretched uh, basically all core services like directory, active directory, DNS, uh, observability, uh, security tools, patching. So it's now stretched to this uh, uh, new landing zone and you can consume those services being there. But in phase two and three for those core services, uh, we're gonna either migrate them as well or uh, rebuild it because some things cannot be migrated in infrastructure case. You need to either rebuild it or, or uh, just uh, even decompose completely. And uh, basically, if you think uh, from application point of view, most of them are running, or a lot are running on VMs. 
So once you move VM from VMware to EC2, it's just a hypervisor that is changing, nothing else. So in operating system level, uh, hypervisor has changed and IP address has changed. So it's kind of cheating on application that you, you are here, but you are not here anymore. And uh, you see open shift uh, box. It's small box, but it means a lot. Uh, because uh, we are building new clusters in uh, AWS as well. Uh, because uh, it's something like 60,000 containers we're running in, in OpenShift and on-premise, and we'll have to migrate them as is as well into AWS. Uh, this arrow showing what I just explained, that uh, same self-service capabilities and no access to developers uh, via UI or API or whatsoever into AWS. And then there will, there will be a set of automation tools. And the next event I will tell about this area, it's um, super complex. Uh, we are working on, on this now. As Ona mentioned, we have tested those tools already. So uh, in the um, last uh, two, three weeks, we migrated eight applications. They are simple ones, but still we wanted to test uh, the concept and approach. And there were no issues. So, so small concept is proved. Now we're going to scale. And just very conceptually, uh, you could take application, which is self-contained. It's running on some components in infrastructure. And I said to application, it will look uh, the same. It will just be transferred as is to AWS, and, uh, and uh, I don't feel any changes. Of course, IP addresses are changing, and we need to deal with it because uh, uh, there might be some hard-coded uh, records, uh, some, some tricks on the way. And uh, mm, networking is uh, a difficult part here because in on-premise, we have extremely highly segmented uh, networks. Um, it's around 150,000 firewall rules in, in uh, internal data center. So you can imagine uh, complexity to take and trans transfer those 150,000 firewall rules to segmented network in AWS. People who know VPC concepts, knuckles, and uh, uh, security groups, it's extremely difficult. I need to speed up. <laughs> or is it changing? I'm sitting and you can... No? <laughs> We are on the record. <laughs> I will skip this part. It's uh, patterns. Estate. So I'll speed up now because some people know estate, but uh, some people who don't, just imagine the numbers which we are dealing with, right? Stor storage subsystem. Uh, so raw logical capacity is close to 12 petabytes. This is actually what uh, VMDKs, uh, virtual, uh, virtual machine disks are, uh, basically con consuming. We have compression level, but uh, once you migrate VMDK into EBS, compression is gone. You, you have to inflate the disk. So our kind of estate is uh, 12 petabytes. We have Hatoop, uh, which is not in scope right now for the migration. It has a little bit different tough and non-prod workloads. So just to migrate 12 petabytes, if we would be using one gigabit per second line, it would take close to three years. And we cannot afford that mo that much because our ambition is uh, two to three years. So we have uh, now uh, into Frankfurt region uh, uh, 100 gigabits per second line, max encrypted, and uh, we will utilize probably about 50 of that line for continuous data replication. So you could do the math and you could understand how much time would it would take if we do continuously uh, non-stop. Non uh, databases, it's a lot, close to 40,000 databases. Uh, they are running on uh, uh, 3,000 plus instances. You see the numbers of provisioned compute capacity. So, so all of that we will need to kind of throw over the fence and run it on AWS. And all of that will be running on fleet of EC2s. So again, if you're doing the math, you could think how many EC2s we will need to facilitate those databases some hotels and uh, other flavors. All in all, um, yeah, some estate to handle. And uh, compute, uh, said we are running highly virtualized, so close to 17,000 VMs. 
uh, again, some numbers about uh, what it means in, in the compute power. So those EC2s will be uh, provisioned and they will run actually in, in, in public cloud. Uh, segregation between environments and uh, OS uh, flavors. So it's like almost 50-50 uh, Linux versus Windows machines. And I think, uh, yeah, again, some illustration about the speed. If we were to start migration today, 10 VMs per day, it would take 4.5 years. And we cannot afford it, uh, so migration waves will be handled a little bit differently, and I'll, I'll explain it soon. A uh, couple sentences about uh, OpenShift. Uh, we are running uh, four pairs of uh, independent clusters. Uh, two zones two data centers, prod, non-prod. Uh, I said something like uh, 60,000 containers. And uh, there are some, um, not some, actually quite many uh, dependencies. Uh, you cannot just take and build a new cluster. It cannot run just like that. It, it has dependencies on uh, pipelines, on uh, other core systems like uh, Active Directory, DNS, uh, uh, NTP, and, and you name it. So for now, we are building it one-to-one -one onto AWS, but during the modernization phase, uh, I think we'll have to change architecture because running independent clusters um, in public cloud where you have free availability zones doesn't make too much sense. And uh, to put it into perspective, so you take all that estate and then you think, okay, so how do I migrate it all uh, in two or three years? And definitely we cannot do it uh, just, you know, picking up uh, that in that application and blindly trying to do it. So uh, it's capability-based uh, approach. So we calculated that about uh, 176 applications will need uh, basic uh, technical capabilities like uh, network, uh, segmentation, uh, and basically Cloud2 integration for the self-service and automation. And just having that, we could uh, migrate already uh, 168 applications. And that's our, uh, basically, agenda from uh, Q1 next year. I said Cloud2 uh, and the new landing zone is something like 70-80% uh, built, and we tested it out. So we'll start uh, um, moving real applications at scale beginning of next year. And then gradually we'll be building next capabilities like uh, load balancing, uh, AZ load balancing, SQL clusters, and, and so on. And uh, these will stack number of applications we can migrate to AWS to reach total number of uh, 1,000 eventually. Yep. Um, and then last uh, piece of the storyline for today is uh, discovery and wave planning. Um, it's extremely important to understand your estate because we are doing infrastructure-based migration. So there is no um, uh, direct interaction to application teams, owners, architects to decouple application architecture and understand how it works. So if you take infra infrared approach, you need to have data points to understand uh, firewalling, to understand integrations, uh, to understand uh, uh, all the bits and pieces about uh, application. And only, only having this, those data points, we need to plan it correctly. So um, discovery phase is extremely crucial. And uh, we're doing that by uh, enhancing our meta database, so-called uh, MDB. I don't know, I haven't seen guys from this area uh, in this room, but uh, they are doing a great job, basically. It's very high-level concept, but uh, it takes about uh, 20 data sources uh, does uh, ET ETL processing and uh, drops the data into uh, Mongo. And uh, it will contain or contains already about 14 data schemes with close to 200 attributes. Uh, and we now have reached close to 100 attributes. And uh, we think that it's enough for uh, phase one. So we could, having 100 attributes, we can already understand how application works and, and uh, start migration. That's um, 
lower screenshot indicates um, data model we're talking here. Um, very busy slide. Uh, don't pay too much attention, but this is um, um, information flow for you just to understand what does it mean to kind of logically design data flow of uh, discovery phase, which will be used uh, as input to migration wave planning and then actual migration execution. So that circle on the corner shows scope of today's speech. So uh, we will be using uh, um, AWS native migration tools, AWS Migration Hub, MGN, uh, data replication services, and things like that. And one of tools is uh, wave planning, and uh, it's called the uh, EC2 sizing recommendation tool. It's actually coming from Migration Hub. So we will input a lot of data into a migration planning tool, and then we'll get a response back. And uh, it's kind of API-based, and uh, uh, quite many microservices built on top of lambdas, which will orchestrate it all. And eventually, the result will be so that uh, this uh, green box MDB 2.1 will get uh, sizing recommendation and other data, which will then um, convert into principles, and those principles will convert into actual servers which will migrate. And that's actually me after migration is done. <laughs> Doesn't look like. So some principles. Um, it's um, capability group based. So you saw in like three slides back uh, that we need to build some capabilities to migrate some, some servers. So uh, it, it's kind of, we group by capability, like CG1 is compute, uh, CG2 is balancing, and so on and so on. And uh, having those capabilities, we will break down into more details, like, like per environment uh, and uh, per criticality, and eventually we'll get migration waves. So one wave will take four weeks, uh, first week is onboarding and preparation. Uh, then we'll start data replication. And uh, uh, eventually migration will be on week three, actual switch over. Uh, we tested out that uh, one medium server takes about 40 minutes to convert. So replication happens in, in kind of in the background. You don't, you don't need to do anything. And source application still runs. And during cutover, it's about 40 minutes downtime uh, per server. But uh, we test it with small scope. If we take application with like 50 or 100 servers, it might take uh, a lot more. So it's definitely be going to be maintenance breaks. And uh, um, depending on complexity of application, it might be also kind of half day or day maintenance break. Yep. So I had to speed up a little bit, uh, but uh, I think that's the wrap up of the storyline as of now. Uh, looking forward to see you next event, and uh, thanks for attention. Uh, have a good evening. <laughs>